I spent years planning my life down to the molecular level. Science gave me the tools to predict, to optimize, to control. At least that's what I believed. As a molecular geneticist and person painfully addicted to control, I approached parenthood with the kind of meticulous planning normally reserved for assembling nuclear reactors. I reconsidered my habits. I treated sleep as if it was an Olympic sport, and I proudly held two years gold medal in an uninterrupted night rest. Who of you could say the same? <laughs> I saw having a child as the ultimate experiment, one where everything would be under my command long before conception. I religiously took folic acid. I ran every test imaginable, over reserve screening, vaccinations, genetic screening, everything. Of course, all my meticulous planning revolved around in vitro fertilization. It never even occurred to me I would get pregnant from the first try, old-fashioned way. And just like that, my carefully controlled experiment became a lot messier and a lot less supervised. Let's talk about genetics and how it is used in reproduction. It all really took off after the first successful in vitro fertilization baby was born. And since then, things have escalated quickly. We can now screen embryos for Down syndrome, determine their sex. It's not quite designer babies yet, but give it some time. Thanks to pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, we can filter out severe genetic disorders before implantation. But we didn't just stop there. Now we can screen for BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations in genes linked to hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, and we can reduce the risk of passing them on. We can detect mutations in genes like HBB linked to sickle cell disease. Even some forms of early onset Alzheimer or rare metabolic disorders, we all we can identify them all before embryo ever gets a chance to implant. And it's not about just avoiding diseases. For example, ACTN3, so-called sprinter gene. One version makes you more suited for explosive power-based sports like sprinting, uh, weightlifting, basically anything where you move fast and break records. Another version helps with endurance. It's long-distance running, cycling, so anything where you suffer for hours. Naturally, I checked my own DNA just in case I was unknowingly squandering some Olympic potential. Turns out I'm genetically optimized for sitting at my desk and reading scientific papers. Fantastic. Another cool example is the gene called DEC2. It is linked to those rare, smug individuals who function perfectly on four hours of sleep. Four. Again, not my case. I need my solid eight hours and ideally a caffeine IV. <laughs> so, for a few blissful decades, we believed our genes held all the answers, that they were the ultimate blueprint who, who we'd become. But in reality, they're more like a checkbox, which life regularly ignores. If genes were destiny, I would be an opera singer with an ability to do mental math without breaking into a cold sweat. Instead, I can barely hold a tune, and I still count on my fingers sometimes. So much for genetic determinism. Sure, we can now predict disease risks, we can spot certain traits, and even take a peek into a genetic lottery in, for things like athletic abilities, or maybe even intelligence. But genes don't guarantee anything. They just give you a shot. What happens next depends on everything, from your environment to sheer dumb luck. My daughter proved that beautifully. Despite her perfect genetic start, 
She didn't crawl until nine months. It's later than average. She didn't walk until she was 15 months. Not because anything was wrong, she just preferred to be carried on hands like a tiny empress. Meanwhile, she recognized herself in the mirror at six months. It's a milestone most, baby hit, most babies hit at 18 months. So, unique genes, unique timing. So, genes play a role, but whether it's crawling, calculus, or handling spicy food, they are not the final word. We are born with a genetic draft, but life constantly rewrites it. Our environment is negotiating with our DNA, deciding which chapters to highlight, which to skip, and occasionally scribbling good luck with that on the margin. Imagine a world where your body can change in real time, adapting to your choices, your emotions, even childhood hugs. Sounds like a plot of sci-fi movie, right? Except it's not. It's epigenetics. And you've been hacking your own DNA since the day you were born. Epigenetics studies how your actions and your environment can switch on or switch off your genes. Think of your DNA as Netflix. Each gene is a show in your massive catalog, and epigenetics is an algorithm deciding which shows to promote to the trending now section and which to get buried so deep you forget they ever exist. And just like Netflix, your environment constantly reshapes what's on your front page. Take stress, for example. Have you ever felt your stomach drop when you see an email from your boss or your partner simply saying, can we talk? Uh, it turns out chronic stress in childhood can alter your cortisol-regulating genes, so they effectively training your DNA to be permanently on high alert. It's a great survival strategy. If you're a gazelle being hunted by lions, it's less helpful if your biggest predator is passive-aggressive message on WhatsApp. So here, where it gets even weirder, even before conception, my daughter's genetic potential was shaped by not only my careful planning, it was influenced by things completely outside my control. Like what my partner, who is, by the way, in this audience, ate for breakfast, or whether he was stressed at work. Both of these can alter the epigenetic markers in sperm cells and later affect everything from metabolism to brain development. So that means while I was obsessing over all these night sleep hours, over my prenatal vitamins, tests and everything, my daughter's future was also being affected by someone else's bacon sandwiches. So what does epigenetic teach us? We are not our genes. We are constantly evolving, self-updating, environment-driven biological experiment, which means your choices matter, whether it's getting enough sleep, eating your greens, or occasionally hugging your parents. We love to believe we're in control. We love it. But random events often have the biggest impact. Sometimes, life just hits shuffle mode, and we end up with an unexpected track in our carefully selected playlist. Even at a cellular level, randomness has a role. Stochastic gene expression, also called genetic noise, is a very important thing which ensures no two single cells are exactly alike. Same with two individuals. For example, this randomness helps cells to decide whether to become a neuron, a muscle cell, a bit of skin. It's truly amazing. And here is something really mind-blowing. My daughter is still inside me right now. During pregnancy, fetal cells migrate into mother's body and can stay there for decades. They infiltrate her lungs, heart, even the brain. They can help heal wounds. They can modulate immune system. 
or in some cases, they can trigger autoimmunity. So motherhood changes you literally. But every now and then, science gives you a way to get some control back. Take, for example, broccoli. We all know broccoli is a deeply divisive vegetable. Some people find it unbearably bitter. For others, it's just fine. This is not just your personal preference. It's written in your DNA. There is this gene called TAS2R38, taste receptor 38. It can make you a super taster who experiences bitter compounds in foods like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale. So they taste for you with horrifying intensity. If you don't have this copy of the gene, broccoli can taste just fine, maybe even sweet. But genes don't tell the whole story. Culture and experience can override biology. In Japan, children grow surrounded by bitter flavors. Matcha, fermented soybeans, they get used to them. Meanwhile, Western diets tend to mask this bitter flavor with sugar, reinforcing the idea that bitter equals bad. So if you grow up in a household where broccoli is celebrated, steamed, roasted, blended into soups, your brain learns that this weird green T-shaped thing is just another food. And so, despite whatever her genes may or may not say, my daughter loves broccoli. She wasn't born loving broccoli, I just tricked her brain into thinking that's normal. Motherhood is 90% deception and 10% hoping they never figure it out. <laughs> Giving birth is often described as the ultimate loss of control. If you ever experienced it, you know what I mean. If you merely witnessed it, you really know what I mean. <laughs> But nothing, even giving birth, prepared me to the moment when my daughter climbed onto a scooter and vanished into sunset like Mad Max. In three seconds, my brain entered full crisis mode. It was like watching my own limb detach and sprint off with zero regard for its own safety. She was still mine, still my responsibility. I was 100% reliable for her not to kill anyone, and yet, she was operating absolutely independently of my control. A rogue biological entity on wheels. So, there is a moment in parenthood that no test can predict. And it's not the first word or the first step. It's the first time you realize your child, despite your, all your plans, is entirely their own person. And it's both terrifying and beautiful. Science can tell us how we got here, but it cannot always tell us what happens next. And maybe that's the point. Maybe if things we fear, their unpredictability, their randomness, the lack of control, maybe these things are what makes life worth living. And what if, instead of resisting them, we learn to embrace them like we embrace our children, with an open hands and deep breath and vague hope they do not immediately bolt into traffic. Thank you. <laughs>